example of uh, resources in the most unlikely places if we only think about where to look for them. Uh, I believe for our next speaker, uh, Ralph Nader will be returning to introduce him. Is Ralph in the house? All right, everybody, well, make yourselves comfortable. He'll be back. Thank you, Neil. Uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Jacobson. It was uh, many years ago that I interviewed him uh, when he was up at MIT getting his uh, <clears throat> PhD. And I'll never forget the interview. We were interviewing all kinds of <clears throat> graduate students uh, to come to work with us in Washington. Uh, and th those are the days when they stood in line uh, looking for public interest uh, work. And he was finishing his PhD in microbiology from MIT. And uh, one of the questions I asked all the students who I was interviewing was, are you in it for the long run? Or you just want a couple of years uh, to get it on your vitae and then you go to work for the establishment? And I asked Mike, <clears throat> are you in it for the long run? He said, yes. And here he is decades later, uh, and his work has uh, been extraordinarily effective because he's a multifaceted advocate. There would be these big food conventions where they would give awards to some, someone who developed a, a new artificial chemically doused whip for a dessert, and uh, Mike would rush on the stage and <clears throat> Uh, criticize it before he was dragged off the stage. <laughs> uh, uh, the, level of a, the level of degradation of the food supply uh, from A to Z when Mike got underway uh, would, would be uh, stunning to young people today. Uh, the only bread that was sold in the supermarkets largely were Wonder Bread and Tip Top Bread. Uh, you, when you went to the supermarket, you didn't have to look at the label. When you picked the bread up, your fingers and thumb collided. Uh, <laughs> now you have, you have much more variety. At any rate, he, be, he built, we started with us for a short period of time, then he uh, uh, left with two other young scientists, started the Center for Science and the Public Interest, which is the premier group today uh, some of you get the newsletter, Nutrition Action. If you don't, you really should. Uh, it has a huge circulation, uh, and it comes out with information you can use, and it's very colorful and very uh, succinct. And uh, Mike uh, said he doesn't want to give a speech today. He wants to have a discussion. So we want Mike to, c to come up here, and we'll have a discussion. Thank you. You know, Ralph, that um, your little introduction reminded me of uh, going up on the stage. That was um, 
we gave the annual Bon Vivant Vichyssoise Memorial Award to the biggest junk food producer of the year. And you remember, I don't know how many of you remember Bon Vivant Vichyssoise soup. It killed people because it was contaminated with botulism. So we thought it was, uh, that should be uh, memorialized. And the award was a beat up old garbage can that we would bring with us to the annual convention of the Institute of Food Technologists, who is a membership group that devised Cool Whip and, and Jell-O and all kinds of other uh, crap that lines, line, lined and lined supermarket shelves to try to give a little attention to the issue. See, he is a genius at uh, informing the media with irresistible uh, displays and demonstrations. And he uh, would appear on the Donahue show, the Mike Douglas show, the Merv Griffin show, and he'd have, based on the recipes of the processed food companies, he, he would say, if you eat a cheeseburger or, or, or a, a hamburger, here's how much fat slithers down your throat. And so he would hold it up. I actually did this once too. He would hold it up. It was like this. I mean, it was, people would go like this. <laughs> to this day, I meet people on airplanes who say, I saw you on, uh, you know, Mike Douglas. What do you remember? I, that stuff. <laughs> and from hot dogs and, and so on. But I and, think that, you know, and Joan was alluding to it yeah. also, of try to dramatize the issues with something concrete, something people can relate to. And uh, you remember the Junk Food Hall of Shame yeah. that we had at uh, Public Citizen Visitor Center <laughs> that uh, really captured people's attention by depicting how much fat or the artificial colorings or what, went in, what actually went into our food. One thing about uh, Mike and his associates is that uh, they deal with the massive silent violence that kills people and gives them diseases. You know, most of the media deals with uh, overt violence, so street crime, police uh, brutality, wars, uh, that, that sort of thing. Uh, but when you consider how many people die in this country from silent violence, uh, 60,000 die from air pollution, it's over 1,000 a week, uh, EPA figures. About the same amount die from work-related diseases and, uh, and trauma in the job. 700 die every day, according to Johns Hopkins report, every day from mishaps that are preventable in hospitals, including malpractice and hospital-induced infections. And Mike has focused, before we get into the other things, I always identify CSPI and Nutrition Action, Mike, with folk, you focused on three uh, ingredients in our food that a lot of people are being overdosed with. Fat, sugar, and salt. Can you go through, uh, A, what it was like before you came to Washington? What kind of progress is made now? Before you do that, how many people die, have died? What's the estimate? How many people have died or gotten sick from those three? Over, well, per year, probably 150,000 people or so. Um, excess sodium from salt, about 100,000 a year. Um, sugar. Um, the best estimate I've seen is from one, the main food in which sugar is used, soda pop. 25,000 people die every year because of the obesity and diabetes. Um, and fat is complicated because there are different kinds of fat, uh, some much better than others. The worst ones, uh, the worst fat is trans fat. And that's from partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. We could talk a little more in detail, but um, Harvard scientists estimated that that was causing, in its heyday, the 1990s, 50 to 100,000 excess deaths every year. So just astonishing. And these are from the ingredients that people thought for decades totally harmless. Salt and sugar are on our kitchen tables and trans fat has been used in Crisco, was used in Crisco no longer, since about 1910. And so everybody was familiar with it and just uh, thought it was innocence. You, you've pounded on trans fat with great success. I mean, he, he's sort of a watchdog on the Food and Drug Administration, Department of Agriculture, and, and his staff along 
with him working regularly. Tell us about the progress in trans fat and Mayor Bloomberg and other efforts. Well, trans fat makes for a great, great story. Um, industry in the 90s was marketing about 8 billion pounds a year of partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. And up through the, <clears throat> up until, <clears throat> up until 1990, partially hydrogenated vegetable oil was considered perfectly safe. Um, the government did a, published a couple of reports, one in the 70s, one in the 80s, that looked at all the research and found little shreds of research su suggesting it was dangerous, but those studies were never confirmed and so it was continued to be considered safe. Until 1990, a European study showed that trans fat raised the bad cholesterol and probably lowered the good cholesterol, a double whammy. And that was confirmed three years later by a Department of Agriculture study that really was a, a key study um, and shows the value of independent government-funded research. And so in 1993, we petitioned the FDA to require labeling of trans fat. And um, I don't want to go into all the details, but um, it took FDA 10 years to require the labeling of trans fat. 10 years, and what, <coughs> just what are some of the products that people eat with trans fat? Well, there is Crisco and everything with, with vegetable shortening. McDonald's and every other fast food restaurant's French fries, fried chicken. You know, we were uh, drenching our foods in trans fat. Um, and the, the controversy and then the labeling made tremendous progress in getting rid of it. Uh, so the 1993 uh, mandate for labeling, um, and right about then, Denmark banned partially hydrogenated oil. And so the FDA is still talking about labeling, Denmark is banning. So we petitioned, and, and the evidence had gotten so strong with both those clinical studies and epidemiological studies that uh, that warranted us to urge and petition the FDA to ban partially hydrogenated oil, um, which the FDA didn't do until 2015, another 10-year delay. But trans fat really became um, um, a dirty word, and so many companies started labeling their foods, no trans fat, and it has been um, largely whisked out of the food supply. 90% or more of trans fat is gone. Seven to seven and a half billion pounds a year. And it really shows the, the, uh, the impact, starting with the scientific research, because that really has been the foundation. And then years of, of advocacy, pressure on food companies not to use it. Food companies told oil processors, give us better oils. Oil processors went back to farmers and said, grow better different kinds of soybeans and, and rapeseed, canola, and so on. And, and we'll pay you more money if you do. And so the farmers grew this stuff. This, um, the oil processors had more raw materials. They sold to the food companies. And so this, this is a good success story. A huge success story. Uh, let, let's, turn to, uh, let's turn to sugar. Uh, by the way, all those national TV programs, they're gone now. Uh, Mike cannot get on any of these shows, like the Phil Donahue show, 10 Million People, and all the other shows. You just look at what has replaced them. Uh, to total junk, uh, masochistic, sadistic, uh, who's this, who's that. So that has not improved. And uh, uh, you're, you're unable to reach the number of people you reached. Uh, and here's how you would do it, for example, the classic Coke uh, can in the classic Pepsi can, and you say, how many of you have had this? You know, all the hands go up. You say, pretty sweet, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, let's say you were uh, making this Coke drink, and you put the water in, you put the secret formula from Atlanta, and you want to put the sugar that you want in it. Uh, how many teaspoons? Uh, somebody say one, two, three. Fewer hands would say, I like it really sweet for, how many teaspoons of sugar? 10 teaspoons of sugar in each 12 ounce can of Coke. Uh, we dramatized that in a video 
called the happiness stand, yeah. where we show the making of this happiness potion. Yeah. All right, now the damage of <coughs> excessive sugar. Uh, people, for example, take far, far more sugar in their diet uh, than 1900. Uh, what, what's the advantage? What's the uh, harm from the, all that sugar? Well, when, when I started in the early 70s, uh, tooth decay was the harm. And we'd go out there yelling and screaming, and people would be, uh, some people would be irate about sugar causing tooth decay. Um, but beginning, <clears throat> beginning around 2000, uh, there was developed solid evidence that sugar was a major contributor to diabetes and heart disease and obesity. And that really turned the tide. <clears throat> and so since 2000, uh, there's been major progress in reducing soda consumption and sugar consumption more, more generally. How much does that do to bottled water? Uh, more people taking bottled water instead of Coca-Cola. Well, it's hard to know cause and effect, but bottled water sales have, have skyrocketed. And b drinking bottled water now, environmental uh, problems aside, is seen as being hip. Soda is being uh, considered more kind of retrograde. And soda consumption per capita has declined, and this is uh, full calorie uh, carbonated uh, drinks, declined by 27% since 1998, which is an astonishing change. You know, the tide is really turning, and partly because of bottled water, but also just the image and more people hearing the scientific research. Center for Disease Control has funded New York, Philadelphia, Seattle, Los Angeles, other places, to run advertising criticizing sugary drinks. You know, so it's a remarkable change. Yeah, completely uh, <coughs> reverse. It's the old story, the blasphemy of today becomes the commonplace of tomorrow. All right, let's go to facts. But, uh, you know, one more thing yeah. about uh, soda. The soda industry, Coke and Pepsi, they know that soda sales are tanking in this country and will probably consider, continue to go down. So they are investing literally billions of dollars a year in marketing soda in developing countries. A billion, Coke, just Coke, is, spending, is investing a billion dollars a year in China, a billion in Mexico, a billion in Brazil, a billion in, in um, uh, India, one and a half billion dollars in Africa, just astonishing investments. China and India, people drink this much soda a year. Here we drink this much soda. They see those as the huge markets for the future. And replacing fruit drinks, native fruit drinks, like Guarana in uh, Brazil. Uh, so they're trying to wean people off more nutritious uh, fruit drinks uh, with, uh, with this uh, type of, uh, of soft drink. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's often said that Coca-Cola has reached more areas of the world than anybody other than mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, it's a close uh, call. Yeah. <clears throat> Let, let's talk about salt now. Uh, we had a meeting with the Secretary of Agriculture, Mike and I and some others, and uh, I think uh, Mike sort of startled the Secretary of Agriculture, Vilsack, when he talked about salt. And why did they put so much salt in the food, when you don't even think it's in there. Go ahead. It's the cheapest flavoring there is. So um, we're consuming, so there's been evidence about the harmfulness of, of too much sodium for 75 years or so. Um, and the evidence builds up every single year. So um, in 1977, I hired a young nutritionist, Bonnie Liebman, to Look at, the, look at the health impact of salt and see what we could do about it. And so in 1978, we petitioned the Food and Drug Administration to limit the amount of sodium in different categories of processed foods and to change salt's regulatory status. You know, there it was killing thousands of people a year, and it was considered generally recognized as safe. So uh, there began the long saga of trying to do something about two salt. And the FDA said um, they're not going to regulate salt, but ask for voluntary industry action. Um, nothing happened. Um, 
we got sodium labeled on food packages in 1990, uh, got a good, the nutrition facts label, and then we went back in the early 2000s to see what had happened to sodium consumption since the labeling law was passed and since our original petition. Nothing had changed, despite all kinds of admonitions to, to industry to lower sodium levels. Um, so we petitioned the FDA again, and we got the Institute of Medicine to do a report on what should be done about sodium, excess sodium, not whether or not it's harmful. That had been settled, but what should be done? And the Institute of Medicine uh, basically endorsed that 1978 petition, saying the FDA should limit sodium levels in cheeses and breads and different levels for these different categories of food. The FDA immediately said, it wouldn't limit the levels, but it might set voluntary targets. So it took another six years. Early, um, uh, earlier this year, the, um, well, uh, the F for five years, the FDA didn't do anything. We sued the FDA for inaction. Public Citizen represented us, and that got the FDA to get off the dime and propose voluntary targets. So. Uh, if we're lucky, those voluntary targets will be adopted as final voluntary targets with two-year and 10-year um, goals. Would, the 10-year goals would bring sodium down to safe levels. Mike, I, I wanted to ask you, you've been pretty critical of the Food and Drug Administration and U.S. Department of Agriculture. <clears throat> Before we get to how you've educated tens of millions of people and how difficult or beneficial that was, What's your brief view of their regulatory protection of consumers now? Well, it starts with the laws, and the laws are not bad. But if you get a law passed, then you have to fund the program. And conservative Congresses starved the programs. So the food labeling, the food safety laws uh, are reasonably good. They could, be they could be enforced with great vigor, going back to the 1950s additives amendment. Um, but the FDA doesn't have the staff and it doesn't have the guts to enforce the laws with vigor, to regulate salt or sugar or um, we've asked for warning labels on soda pop because soda pop causes heart disease and diabetes and obesity. Um, but you know, um, FDA is in, is in a bit of a pickle because if it does anything brave, Congress would crack down and through appropriations riders, stop it from taking one action or another. Um, and the, they just don't have the staff to do many of these things. So the FDA inspects, you know, with the Meat Inspection Act, the, F, the USDA inspects a chicken soup plant factory every single day of the year. Even though it's, it's sterilized, the soup is sterilized, it's not going to harm anybody. They, food processing facility that does not have meat or poultry, like a um, vegetable soup factory, gets visited every five or ten years. So the FDA just doesn't have the resources. And it's very important to ensure that agencies, not ensure, <laughs> desperately try to get the agencies sufficient funding to actually enforce the laws. Have you, <coughs> have you uh, uh, expressed your view on uh, efforts by the meat and poultry industry to have private, privatized inspections to sort of self-regulate themselves instead of having in a daily or frequent uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture meat and poultry inspections? Well, most of those daily or the, it's really continuous inspections of the slaughtering and processing of the animals. <coughs> and those uh, where it's, um, and their inspectors checking to see, look at every carcass. That's almost worthless. What they can find are obvious defects, you know, a serious bruise or a tumor that are more quality than safety, things that the food processors should monitor on their own. Tyson doesn't want to have market chickens with big bruises on them. So uh, they should be responsible for that. Those inspectors that are scrutinizing a chicken, they get one or two seconds 
to look at each chicken. That's how fast the assembly line <laughs> they're is. They're whizzing by. You know, they can't. Yeah. And they're looking for bacteria. You're not going to find bacteria <laughs> looking at a chicken carcass. You need stronger systems. And that's how the, the, um, the, the laws are moving, um, where the, the um, companies will look at the, the, uh, the bruises and tumors, and government inspectors will monitor for the, the systems that should be in place to make to keep the products uncontaminated. Do you think the penalties are strong enough, though, <coughs> for violations? Well, they could be if, if they're brought about. So the uh, Peanut Corporation of America, which killed many people, uh, poisoned uh, thousands of people with contaminated peanuts, uh, the um, chief executives got thrown in jail. But as Russell Mokhyber has indicated uh, earlier, those kinds of um, uh, penalties are rarely uh, invoked. Mike, some people in the consumer area think you're not tough enough on certain issues. So let me throw some on, on the table. Uh, a lot of consumer groups are upset with GMO crops, genetically modified uh, crops. They say that the uh, argument for it is based in secret corporate science, not peer-reviewed, completely opposite to the way you've operated, Monsanto, for example. And that there's no evidence uh, that it increases uh, crop uh, volume uh, around the world and that uh, it migrates and affects other neighboring farms and contaminates other neighboring farms and it just produces its own backlash with uh, the so-called killer weeds uh, mutating uh, and resisting uh, Monsanto's uh, seeds so the Monsanto has to up the ante on those uh, what do you think of all that w where are you on GMO food Genetic engineering is a powerful technology. It's kind of like electricity. And when, when a, such a technology comes before the, the public or society, uh, I think we should try to maximize benefits and minimize problems, like with electricity. Electricity fries people every year. Little babies stick their innocent little fingers in the outlet, and they're dead try to control that because electricity arguably has provided benefits, um, though some of them are arguable. And same thing with genetically modified crops. Some of them may be beneficial, some of them may be dangerous. We should look at each of them individually. Has, has, the, um, have the, the, has the government evaluated the safety adequately? Are farmers using the products appropriately? And sometimes yes or sometimes no. But I think it's crazy to do away with a whole technology that is providing some benefits, could be providing much greater benefits here in, in developing countries in terms of drought resistance, crop yields, and so on. Um, and it's um, naive to say, get rid of the whole technology can provide uh, really uh, major benefits. What about food irradiation? Instead of focusing on sanitation in the plants, you just irradiate the food before it gets to your dinner table. Um, well, I think it would be stupid to rely, to, mark, to have, for a company to be producing dirty food and trying to kill the germs at, uh, just before it leaves the factory. Um, there's no real evidence that irradiation is harmful. Again, maybe it would prevent some of the thousands of, of, food, of uh, foodborne illness deaths every year. It's expensive, and it would be far better to have safe, safety systems in place that would prevent the, the germs from getting into the food in the first place. I've got to finish with a story. When I was a little boy, <clears throat> my, my mother put on the kitchen table fresh celery, uh, radishes, <clears throat> and uh, carrots. And I said, I don't want to eat it. He said, what? I don't like it. I went through, I don't like it. I don't want to eat it. Uh, so she leaned over and said, well, who's I, Ralph? I? It's me. What do you mean, who's I? Is I your liver, your kidney? When you say, I don't want to eat it, is it your lungs? Is it your heart? I didn't even know what she was getting at. 
<laughs> she finally concluded, I know who I is, Ralph, when you say I don't want to eat carrots and radishes, which are very good for you. Uh, and I said, who? And she said, I? I is your tongue. Why are you turning your tongue against your brain? Eat up. Uh, so this is the, now, in this massive educational effort that Mike Jacobson and his colleagues at Center for Science and Public Interest have engaged in, that has to be one of the big issues because the advertisers focus on taste, taste, taste. And after it gets past your mouth, it can be very damaging to all these organs. Uh, how do you deal with that? And in conclusion, Mike, tell people how they can get nutrition action, which I read every time it comes. It's a terrific uh, publication. Well, it's, uh, the tongue is more powerful than the brain in, in so many cases. And, uh, but I think people, you know, so some people, we're not going to get through to some people, so you try to make the food as safe as possible. You know, if salt is dangerous, limit the salt so it's just not as bad. And either the food gets less salt, uh, tastes less salty, or some of the saltiness may be replaceable with other ingredients. The, um, People, so many people have learned that healthy food actually tastes terrific, tastes better than the processed foods with the, kind of the cheap taste of, of sugar and salt. Um, but it can be hard to persuade somebody who's been brainwashed by eating this kind of food. You mean tongue washed? Tongue washed. <laughs> yeah. For, uh, eating this kind of food uh, since they were. Uh, well, you see what uh, just a few people uh, can do is Mike come, came to Washington, he had no money, no contacts, just knowledge, persistence, and a sense that he wanted to make food, safety, and nutrition his life's work. So I guess when you told me that you were in for the long haul back in the 19, early 70s, I guess you were in for the long haul. Didn't, know what, didn't yeah. know what I was getting myself into, but I have to answer the second part of your question. Yeah. Go to... Um, uh, cspinet.org, cspinet.org, uh, and you can sign up for a subscription to Nutrition Action. In print and online? Yeah. yeah. Yes, I, I like the print version. So do I. A nice colorful <laughs> news, newsletter. If you uh, buy a color monitor, you'd get it in color uh, on the internet. <laughs> he, he's talking to someone who uses an Underwood typewriter, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike Jacobs. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ralph and Mike Jacobson. Our next speaker will be uh, talking about empowering consumers subject near and dear to my heart. Um, he, is, uh, he teaches, he's a professor of law at Georgetown University uh, Law Center where he teaches federal courts, civil procedure, administrative law, and seminars in First Amendment litigation. He also co-directs Georgetown's Institute for Public Representation, which is a clinical law program there. Formerly, he was the director of the Federal Trade Commission's Bureau of Consumer Protection, 